13, please. We've been talking about Jesus' parables and why he began to use them, the significance of what he was trying to do. Remember, the word parable means to cast near, to put something nearby so that people could get a hold of it. So he would use the parables to communicate to people. And parables in Matthew 13 were told basically from a boat because the crowds were surrounding him and he chose a boat in which he could communicate and people could gather around him on the shore. Matthew 13 opens with the parable of the sower and the seed and then follows by seven other parables. And each of these parables give us different perspectives of God's perspective. We were, I was talking to the young people this morning about the power of a parable or a, rather a paradigm and how we see the world and we're not naturally wired to see the world from God's perspective. In fact Isaiah 55 God says as the heavens are high above the earth so far are my ways above your ways. So we're not going to grasp God unless we intentionally try to understand life from his perspective. Is it not true in, even in our own relationships? We're not going to really grasp someone else's heart unless we're willing to see from their perspective. The first, the parable of the sower and the seed, mostly is about how people become a part of God's kingdom or the introduction. And, and that parable teaches us that it all depends on how receptive, how prepared our hearts are for the truths of God. It reveals that Satan seeks to inhibit God's truth from taking root or if it manages to take root, it, it competes basically with, with God's uh, truths or tries to deceive us so that we don't fully embrace those truths. The next three parables basically talk not so much about the introduction of God's kingdom, but, but the opposition, how Satan opposes what the work that God is trying to do in our hearts and in our lives. And most, all three of these have one common theme, and that's how Satan seeks to infiltrate God's work, either it corporately like in a context of a church or a family or individually in the context of a human heart. He infiltrates seeking to either contaminate God's truth so we don't grasp them or simply confuse us so that we don't value them. The wheat and the tares focuses on how Satan plants false Christians into the context of our culture or into our churches so that they and many times they don't even know they're Christians uh, or they're, they're not Christians so they're, they're embracing a level of religion. Paul spoke of this they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge because they're going about to establish their own righteousness because we're trying to establish our own righteousness we don't grasp and therefore respond to God's righteousness. The next parable, the parable of the mustard seed, which we'll read in just a moment, it's only a few verses, it's related to and focuses not on necessarily or exclusively uh, false Christians, but the growth that comes is a result of the introduction of false Christians into the work of God. Matthew 13, if you have your Bibles, you can read them or look up at the screen. Another parable, right after talking about the tares and the wheat, Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. I chose that video for the offering because it illustrates just how tiny these seeds really are. It's the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs. The mustard seed is not truly a tree, it's a bush, but it becomes a vast bush and grows tall, taller than a man, often like a tree. And it grows so large that Jesus says, the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now that video I showed you, there are two references Jesus uses to mustard seed. This one in Matthew 13 and later on in Matthew and the other gospels. The other reference is a positive reference. If your faith is like the faith of a mustard seed, you'll be able to say to the mountain, be thou removed and cast in the seed. Nothing will be done or nothing will be impossible. But this passage is not talking about the mustard seed uh, and, and how it grows specifically. The focus is on the birds. It grows so large that the birds find their homes in it. So the danger is, 
of false growth. Jesus did not interpret this parable. He interpreted the first parable he told, the parable of the sower and the seeds. He interpreted the second parable he told, the parable of the tares and the wheat. But he doesn't interpret most of the rest of the parables he tells in his ministry. Why did he interpret these two parables? Well, Jesus asked, if you don't understand the first parable, you're going to have trouble understanding all the others. So we have to look to the first parable primarily to find the clues to understand this and really every other parable. In the first parable, we see the contrast and the competition between what God is trying to do, the good seed, and the weeds that have already been planted in the garden. So there's that, the seed is the word of God, but there are pre-existing things, the rocks and the roots and the weeds that exist in the field or the world. When in the first parable, we see God's truth introduced into the world or into our lives. I illustrated with the young people this morning, uh, look at what my, my very first uh, home away from home I worked in a hotel while I was going to Bible college, and, and uh, they gave me a hotel room, but they didn't really tell me when I signed on the dotted line that I was going to share the hotel room with a foreign exchange student from Germany. We're not talking about an apartment, we're talking about a hotel room. And uh, it was my first experience of, of multicultural living, uh, and, and he was there first. Which means when I got into the room, he already had it decorated, and he had his music. I remember the music. It was Fleetwood Mac. And I was in Bible college. He loved Fleetwood Mac, and he'd play Fleetwood Mac every night. And I really didn't care for Fleetwood Mac. But you know, after a while, guess what I was humming? Fleetwood Mac. It's the nature of things. When God plants his seed into our lives, we're already there. We've already decorated our world. We've furnished our home, our heart, in ways that suited us. And then God comes into our life, and he's trying to find a place, or rather, he's trying, he's trying to redecorate. But he doesn't trash our stuff, does he? He doesn't bake, break our, I'm not, this is not a message on Fleetwood Mac, I'm just using an example. He doesn't break our albums. He simply begins to influence our lives. And that's what this first parable is about. But the focus is on the opposition. The things that we have to do or God seeks to do to, so that we can make room for him in our lives. And of course in verse 19 of this parable in Matthew 13, Jesus is very clear. The birds or the fowl are the wicked one. It's the influence of Satan in our lives. In the second parable, we see that Satan, in the first parable, Satan's already planted the field, right? It's his, and God moves into it, just like we are Satan's. We were all Ephesians 2, we were the children of the wicked one. We were, uh, we were motivated by what we thought were just the lust of our flesh and of our mind and fulfilling the desires of our flesh and our mind. But the very next verse says, but we were by nature the children of wrath. We, we really, we were Satan's field, but God who is rich in mercy in Ephesians 2 said, with the great love that he loved us, by grace we're saved. He revealed himself to us. He planted his truths into our cluttered life. And then we started to grow. And then what did Satan try to do? Try to strangle that growth. The second parable isn't focusing on necessarily how, how Satan planted it first and God started working afterwards. The second parable is now focused on it's God's field. It's the church. It's God's field. He planted good seed. That would be his people and the things he wants to accomplish in his people's life. And then Satan started planting something in their lives. In the first parable, Satan got there first. In this parable, God gets there, and he's at work, and Satan sees God's at work, and he says, how can I sabotage what God is doing? So Satan plants things in our lives after the fact. The tares are the children of the wicked one. So the context is in the kingdom of God. And for our purposes, we'll talk about the church of God. God plants his church, and then what does Satan do? Ignore it? He infiltrates it. Does he destroy the church? He tried that. We'll talk about that. But when he couldn't destroy it, he infiltrated. The tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. And they are allowed to coexist. Grow, let them grow together until the harvest, which is the end of the world. Now in this third parable, we see the inevitable results 
of the wheats and the tares coexisting in the, in the kingdom of God or in the church of God. God's kingdom is church smarts, starts small. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which is the least among the seeds. Think about how Jesus started his church. He ministered to thousand during his public ministry of three years, but he focused on 12. Not exclusively, but primarily on 12. At the end of his ministry, about three years, maybe three and a half years, the last thing he said to the, multi, to the, to the 500 at least that were there when he ascended is tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power on high. We read Acts chapter 1, we found that the church existed of 120 people who obeyed him. It doesn't mean all the rest of the people didn't know him, weren't touched by him, didn't care about him, but 120 disciples, people who chose to follow his instructions. That's what a disciple is, only 120. He fed 5,000 at one time, 7,000 at another time. He healed multitudes, and yet when it came down to obeying him, only 120 people put their world on hold for about 10 days, waiting for the promise that Jesus said was going to come. And that promise came on the day of Pentecost. Then they that gladly received his word, because the Holy Spirit showed up in fulfillment of the prophecies of Joel and other places, they began to preach the word on the Feast of Pentecost, which, by the way, is the Feast of first fruits. And 3,000 people, they that gladly received his word, were baptized, and the same day were added unto them, unto that little church of 120, now there's 3,000 more people, and they, that would be now the 3,120, it wasn't just, just pray this prayer and go your way. No, it was pray this prayer, and then these people were hungry to know more about God's, minute, God's work and God's plan, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayers, and what happened? The Lord began to add to the church daily such as be, should be saved. So there was 120, then when there were 3,120, 3, and then every day people were being brought into the kingdom of God and associated with the church. Now, God's focus would certainly be on unity. Acts chapter 4 verse 32 says this church as it grew, they had things in common, they were, they were sacrificing to meet the needs of one another. But he wanted unity without compromising purity. So in the very next chapter, Acts chapter 5, at the close of chapter 4, we see a man named Barnabas who realized there were people who were struggling in the church. And, and, and I don't have the time to go into this, but Pentecost was at one of the three feasts where Jews would come from all over the area, all over the known world, and they got saved. They would normally go home, but they didn't want to go home yet. Why not? Because they wanted to grow. So there was a huge hardship in the early church because people had embraced Christ and instead of going home like they had every other year after the feast, they wanted to stay. And that produced a hardship. So people like Barnabas began to sell their resources and he sold some land and gave it to the apostles so that they could help provide for this temporary need of this huge influx of believers into the area that didn't go home. So that's the context. And then in Acts chapter 5, a couple in the church named Ananias and Sapphira saw how much, how much appreciation Barnabas got. So they had land and they sold it. But they made on like they gave all of it to the church that they were super spiritual. And, and, and they were just, they wanted, they were motivated not by the need, but they were motivated by the wanting to be praised. It was their ego and their pride. So you can read the passage for yourself, but they lied. And then the Holy Spirit heard it, whispered it to Peter. Peter gave them a second chance. Did you really do? Oh, yeah, we did this. You know, don't break your arm, patting yourself on the back. And Ananias dropped dead. His wife wasn't with him. And she came in later, not knowing what happened to her husband, said, how much did you get for that land? And she lied too. And then she dropped dead. And this is the next verse. Great fear came upon all the church. And, and Peter said, you haven't lied to men. You've lied to God. How many people would be in church if God struck every liar dead? But you understand the context. Why did God do this? Because he's at work, and wherever God is at work, Satan's finding a way to slip in. And in this particular case, it was through pride and, and deception. Deception. 
So great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. And here's the point. Of the rest, no man joined himself to them. In other words, people were kind of cautious about this joining the church business. Why? Because they realized God's paying attention and this is God's work. No man did join himself to them. In other words, this wasn't motivated by men wanting to be a part of this action because they realized there may be a price to pay for deception. But the believers were the more added to the Lord. Do you get the point? Yeah, did they want the church to grow? Yes, but God is interested in unity, but not at the compromise of purity. He didn't want Satan to find his way in in this growing movement So God had to discipline very publicly and very powerfully people. And people said, wait a minute, do I really want to do this? But those who God's heart touched, and that's the the definition of a church, by the way, people God calls together. The people God called together says, "I, I want to be a part of what God is doing. The very next chapter, church was growing Prejudice started to develop. People were neglected. A number of disciples was multiplied. Now it's not being added. It's multiplying. There was a murmuring, complaining against the Hebrews because the widows of the Greek proselytes, the non-Hebrew people, were being neglected. But thankfully, wisdom prevailed, and the apostles said, you know, we got to think through this. This is getting bigger than we can handle. Look out among you seven men full of faith in the Holy Ghost. We can appoint over the business of taking care of the widows. That was the formation of the deacon ministry. And as a result, the word of God increased. The number of disciples multiplied at Jerusalem greatly. You see this pattern already in the early church. Things were going well. Satan's tried to slip in. God stepped up. It became serious. People started second guessing. Do I really want to be a part of this? Only if God was calling them. And then God called people. But then our natural selfish flesh started to assert itself again. And Satan was trying to disrupt it through division. And God's spirit led the apostles to say, okay, we need to form a deacon ministry. And, and God, in other words, Satan would attack. God's people would respond. God would honor them. And the church continued to grow. Well, Twice now in the early church, Satan had tried to get his foot in the door, and it wasn't working very effectively. So he changed tactics. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen was one of those seven deacons originally, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people, and they were not able to resist the wisdom of the Spirit by which he spoke. It was the Holy Spirit that was working through him that they couldn't confound. So what do you do when you can't really answer truth with truth? What are we seeing happening today? Character assassination. It's called the politics of personal destruction. We're just going to destroy the people that we don't agree with. They set up false witnesses and lied about Stephen and eventually had him condemned to death against their own law, by the way, and they murdered him in Acts chapter 8. The result of that is a great persecution. It was like a feeding frenzy. It was the first Christian that was killed in the, in the New Testament, other than, of course, Jesus Christ, and it turned into a feeding frenzy. They started hunting down Christians. The apostle Paul, before it was Paul, was Saul, who was in charge of this, by the way, hunting down Christians and having them put to death. So there was a great persecution against the church. They were all scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, And they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose because of Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch preaching the word. See, Satan tried to use persecution. It did scatter God's people, which was God's plan, by the way. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Tear in Jerusalem until you be due to power. Then you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, on most parts of the earth. So God used it. Satan tried to produce Uh, persecution the persecution caused people to get out of their comfort zones but wherever they went they brought the gospel with them and the church continued to grow in fact Tertullian said 197 AD there were at least 10 seasons of terrible persecution the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church they would hunt Christians down these this picture I don't know how clearly you can see it but they would put them and burn them at the stake. They would feed them to wild animals. They would do, Satan would try to crush the church through persecution. Which did what effect as far as the purity of the church? Why would anyone come to church and embrace the church if it thought, they thought it might cost their lives? 
So who are the only, well, rationally, who, what kind of people would become a part of God's plan at such a price? True believers. So Satan changed his tactics. He still uses persecution, but he added another element, and that's he began to infiltrate the church. Jesus said the mustard seed, it's going to grow, start small, it's going to grow, but it's going to grow to such a point that then the fowls of the air, which Jesus said represented who? The wicked one. The fowls of the air would come and lodge in the branches. If the birds represented the wicked one in verse 19, it's still, they still, and Jesus didn't give a different interpretation, it's reasonable to assume that if they, did, if they represented something else, this is the same conversation, right? Two stories later, if it represented something else, he would have told us it represented something else. Since he didn't, if birds meant Satan here, then what do birds mean here? Satan. If the, if the mustard seed grows and becomes a great tree and Satan and the tree represents what God is doing in his church, and then the fowls of the air start building their nest in the mustard seed, what is in the tree, what is Jesus saying is going to happen? Satan's going to infiltrate his church. Jude talked about this in Jude chapter 4. Jude was the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, still in the early, early church. And he said, I wanted to write a sweet puff piece about all the things we have in common, but he said it was needful for me to write that you have to fight, contend for the faith, because people have crept into the church unawares, ungodly people that Satan is using. So this infiltration, it did begin early in the church in Acts chapter 15. Judaizers came saying, yeah, you got to be saved, but you got to be Jewish too, and you got to be circumcised, you got to keep the law. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul warned the church of Corinth that even Satan transforms himself to an angel of light. He has his own apostles, and, he's, and, and there's preachers inspired by Satan that are infiltrating the church even there. Now, some of the early churches were vigilant. Revelation was written about 95 AD, so this is about 60, 70 years after Jesus rose from the dead. So the church had been around for a while now, and they were going through persecution. John had been persecuted by Domitian, the emperor. He had been exiled to the island of Patmos when he got the revelation. But in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, he's given, he, he's, Jesus dictates letters to send to churches. And the first church is the church of Ephesus. And, and Jesus says, uh, I have somewhat against you, but I have a lot of things. You're doing a lot of good things. And one of the things you're doing good is you can't bear them which are evil. You've tried them which say they are apostles. The word apostles also means someone sent by God. So people would show up at the church saying, God sent me. You've tried them which say they're apostles and are not and have found them liars. This thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. As a teacher, it's hard for me not to get sidetracked in rabbit trails, but the Nicolaitans was an early movement Nicolaitans came from Nicholas who was one of the deacons and the Nicolaitans basically means conquerors of the people they tried to establish a priesthood in the early church they said it worked for the Jews we're going to do it in the church and, and the Nick, movement of the Nicolaitans was a priesthood who saying some people are closer to God than others so you can't go directly to God you got to go through us that was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and Jesus said I hate that doctrine but some churches and some churches were careful some churches were careless, and carelessness always leads to corruption. Paul said in Acts chapter 20, this would have been about 60 AD, Paul gathered the preacher, the pastors in the, in the community of Ephesus together and said, take heed unto yourselves and over the, unto the flock which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Feed the flock of God. But take heed, because after my departure shall grievous wolves come in, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves will some arise, wanting to make disciples after themselves. So Paul's warning them, be careful, Satan's going to infiltrate the church. And he looked at these preachers and said, and he's going to try to use some of you to do it. The, the second, let me think, Ephesus, the third letter in Revelation chapter 2, another church Thou hast them, remember church of Ephesus was careful. Pergamus, thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Thou hast also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. You see, two churches, two different areas. One of them was trying those who were saying they're representing God and they're, they're not. But now this church is allowing them in. 
You're, embra- you're allowing people who are teaching, who have the doctrine of Balaam, you're allowing people who, into the church, who are bringing this corruption of the Nicolaitan movement. Church of Thyatira. These things saith the Son of God who hath eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass. What's that about? Brass is always a sign of judgment in the Bible. It was the brazen altar, the altar that you would put your sacrifices on. Jesus is standing there and brass represents purification and he says, I'm watching you and I'm trying you. I have a few things against you because you suffer. That means you allow the woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophet, is someone from me, to teach and seduce my servants unto the rest of the church of the Thyatira as have not known this doctrine or the, or the depths of Satan. What is, what is he saying into this church? You're tolerating someone who says they're from me and are not. And how does he describe that doctrine? The depths of Satan. What, what you get in the picture? Satan is getting inside of the church. This accelerated when persecution finally ended. There were t- at least 10 seasons of terrible persecution on the early church. In 312 AD, the emperor died and, and two men, Maxentius and, and Constantine, were generals and they were fighting each other for who's going to be the next emperor. The day before the battle of the Milvian Bridge, Constantine said he had a vision. In this vision, he saw a, I think it was a blue cross, and, and the sig, a, a sign in Latin that said, in this sign, conquer. Well, he knew that the cross was symbolic of that despised religion of Christianity. He had this vision, and he took it. They, he was a very religious person. He was a pagan and they worship all kinds of gods, but you're on the back. He, his army was smaller than Maxentius' army. He gets this vision. What is a religious, per, religious person going to interpret this vision from? This is from God. So he said, in this sign, conquer. So what he did is he literally had crosses painted on the shields of his army. He marched his army through a river and said, now you're all Christians. And a miracle happened. They won. Now, kind of put yourself in pagan Rome. The emperor just declared he's embracing Christianity. He forced all of his soldiers to become Christians. He wins, and he's coming back to Rome. That's the context. The very, one of his first acts was the Edict of Milan, which basically said, you can't kill Christians anymore. You can't persecute Christians. In fact, he invited Christians to Rome on his dime, to have one of the first councils over which he presided, interestingly enough, is Pontifus Maximus, which is the old title of the high priest of all the Roman religions. Pontifus Maximus. Constantine the emperor presided over the first Christian council that was legal. Christianity went from being persecuted to being protected and promoted. What was the result? Well, if you were a priest in pagan Rome and the emperor just got converted, and by the way, so did his army. I am being sarcastic, but that's what happened. And now he's coming back with this army and he starts promoting Christianity. What would you do? Would you do what most politicians do? The winds are changing. That's exactly what happened. Pagan priests converted in order to remain in prison. Pagan temples were converted to churches. This is the Roman pantheon, filled filled with little niches. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Little niches that honored their various gods. What happened to the pantheon? A historical fact, what happened to the pantheon after Constantine became the emperor? What happened to the Parthenon and the Acropolis in Athens? Well, the Parthenon eventually was renamed The church of the Theotokos, which means the church of the mother of God. What was once used to honor the Greek gods was now converted to a church. The Pantheon, they took those niches. I know it's a small picture, but it's a a beautiful building, but in different, there's no corners because it's round, but there's niches where there would be idols set up and pagan deities that you would come and make prayers to and make offerings. Guess what happened? You can go there, I've been there, I've seen it. They changed the names of the idols and made them apostles. They turned the apostles and the early church fathers into demigods. 
pagan holidays, the holidays that the Roman Empire would celebrate to, 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 to celebrate pagan deities, they became Christianized. Esther, Easter, Esther, Istar became Easter. Lupercalia became St. Valentine's Day. I don't have the time to go into these, but they're very interesting studies. Samhain became Hallowed Eve. They turned November 1st into All Saints Day. Samhain was a day of the dead, celebrating the dead, making offerings to the dead. So it became Hallowed Eve, which we now celebrate worldwide as Halloween. Saturnalia, worshiping the sun god, became Christmas pagan practices eventually became church doctrines and we'll talk more about that next week when we talk about the parable of the leaven these infiltrations into the early church eventually led to what we know as the dark ages the dark ages in which the church not every church but the church in mass outlawed the bible why would a church do that why would anybody embracing God in Christ say, you can't own a Bible, you can't read the Bible. In fact, if you're caught with the Bible, we're going to kill you. Do you get the picture of what Satan was doing? He had so infiltrated the church that the Bible became a forbidden book. Jesus said in John 16 too, the time will come where they will kill you and think they're doing God a service. But when God's wouldn't be held back and the seed continued underground at first with the printing press the invention of the printing press in the 1400s it became more easy to distribute God's word what happened when people started getting the Bible they began to see the church in a new light and the corruption that had entered the church and new churches and new movements and the reformation movement was born this reformation movement when it moved to England created the Anglican Church, which was politically motivated. You guys know I love history, and i got to be real careful because I want to get somewhere. So what happened to the people who had the Bible? See, the Anglican Church wouldn't let people have the Bible in England. They could have the common book of prayer, and church was about reading out of the common book of prayer, which had been edited, of course, by the king and by his ministers. Then a little movement came up called the Separatist Movement, we know them as our pilgrim forefathers. And the, the king and the Anglican church persecuted them and said, you either worship like us or King, I think it was King James said, I will harry you out of the country. And that's what happened. So the pilgrims moved to America. Marvelous story that. And they signed the Mayflower Compact and they founded Mass uh, Plymouth Colony. Some of the people in the Church of England that didn't run, didn't separate, they were called Puritans. And they didn't want to leave the Church of England. They just wanted to kind of handpick some of the corruption. And they were the wealthy people because they, honestly, they made some compromises to get along. And then they founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony the, the, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. Eventually, the more influential, powerful Puritans swallowed up the pilgrims, which means the separatist, and New England became Anglican congregational. Within a few years, this purity and liberty became compromised. Solomon Stoddard became the, pa well, he wasn't the pastor, he was an influential Puritan preacher. And in 1662, how many of you know Cotton Mather? You know the name from history, famous Puritan preacher. His brother pastored the church of Northampton, Massachusetts. And him and Cotton were kind of Puritans and cautious and guarded and trying to maintain the purity of the church. Solomon Starter was another famous preacher and he, didn't, he was more of a liberal. And he said, you know, our churches are shrinking. People aren't coming to church anymore. We got to get them back. So Solomon Stoddard came up with uh, something called the Halfway Covenant. Because in those days, you couldn't vote in elections if you weren't a church member, and you couldn't be a church member, at least, it, 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 and you couldn't participate in communion unless you were born again, or at least gave evidence of being born again. And people were, in, were growing less and less interested in church. Now their prosperity was growing, and people were leaving the church. So they came up with this plan. Let's go ahead and let the non-Christians baptize their children in the church and they can be voting members, both the non-Christians and their children can be voting members in the church, but we won't allow them to take communion. 
You with me so far? I know this is a little complicated. It was a little compromise to build the the church back up because people were ignoring the church. And well-meaning, they wanted people in church to be exposed to the Word of God, so they compromised how to become a church member. Eventually, Stoddard took over that church, and eventually Stoddard compromised. Now that he has this church full of voting people that weren't saved, and they wanted to do what? They didn't want to be judged. What do you mean you're not going to let me have communion? So they started putting pressure on him. Well, being the astute politician, what did Solomon Stoddard do? The covenant initially was you can't, you can't participate in communion unless you're born again and give evidence of being born again. But after a while, the church was filled with unconverted people who didn't like feeling judged on communion time. So what, what did Solomon Stoddard do? He erased that as well. Forward the clock In 1727, his grandson, Jonathan Edwards, became his associate pastor. His grandfather died, and his grandfather, it was the largest church, one of the largest churches in the colonies. No surprise there. It was one of the most influential churches in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. No surprises there. Now, his grandson has a conscience. And if you've ever read the confessions of Jonathan Edwards, he was, a, he was deeply spiritually minded. And he became the assistant pastor in 27, and his grandfather died, became the pastor in 1729. His preaching led to the great awakening of America. George Whitfield came in from England. Jonathan Edwards, one of the sermons that you can Google today, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He wrote and he preached. And this is an excerpt. A true and faithful Christian does not make holy living an accidental thing. Remember in that day, the challenge was just because you're a church member doesn't mean you're a Christian. So he's talking about, he's preaching in churches. George Whitfield preached in fields. Jonathan Edwards preached in churches. He preached sinners in the hands of an angry God in churches because the churches were filled with unrepented people. A true and faithful Christian does not make holy living an accidental thing. It is his great concern. As the business of the soldier is to fight, so the business of the Christian is to be like Christ. Revival started springing. People started getting converted in churches across America because of the preaching of Jonathan Edwards. Well, remember his granddad had set the stage where in his own church you didn't have to be saved to participate in communion. Well, Jonathan Edwards had a conscience and had some eyes and had a Bible and said, God said, I'm going to judge you if you do this. So he, started, he tried to change that. He tried to withhold communion from people that didn't confess that they were born again and didn't give any evident, credible evidence of being born again. Well, how did the tares in his church react? This was the most famous preacher in America in in the 1730s and 40s. They fired him. Notice the vote, 230 to 23. 230 people in one of the most prestigious churches in America, and they they could only find 23 people who would stand with him. He had seven or eight daughters The only job he can find was a missionary to the American Indians at the time. Now here's my point. Just a a historical example. When the focus of the church becomes external numbers, however you measure those numbers, how many people are in the pews, how many buildings you have, how how much dollar, how how much money you have in the church. In other words, it's earthly, human, worldly value system instead of internal conversion and transformation, life, heart, change. What happens? Satan has succeeded in nesting in the church. And there are always predictable results. I gave you several in history. The church may grow in numbers and influence, but God's spirit is grieved and we forfeit God's blessing. Paul, his last letter to Timothy, pastor in the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus was where he, Jesus wrote that letter in Revelation 2, that you've tried them who say they're apostles and are not. You found them liars. You've, you've opposed the doctrine, the influence of the Nicolaitans, because I hate that. 
Paul wrote to Timothy, the pastor of that church, I charge you before God, preach the word. Instant in season, out of season. That's not talking about winter, spring, summer, fall. That's talking about whether people want to hear it or not. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Challenge with the truth. With all long suffering, that means patience, and doctrine, not your personal opinions, represent God's word. Because the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. Who is he writing to? He's writing to a pastor. He's writing to a church. And he's saying there's going to come a time where the church will be so full of unconverted people or non-spiritually minded people that they're going to react to God's word. They're not going to want to deal with it no, any more than Solomon Stoddard's congregation wanted to deal with the fact that, what do you mean I can't take communion? You think you're holier than I am? So what will they do? They will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and will turn away their, truths from the, their, their ears from the truth and turn to fables. Muthos is the Greek word. It's spelled mythos, and it's where we get our English word myths. Remember Daniel shared this with us last week? These statistics. The only way these statistics make sense is if the vast majority of people who call themselves Christians are not really born again Christians. They're religiously educated. 98% of Christians don't reflect Christ's like attitude. I, I can give them that. We all have a flesh no matter where we are and sometimes the flesh leaks out and that's what people smell instead of the gracious spirit of God. 63 don't believe Jesus is the son of God. That's impossible. You can't be a, a real genuine Christian without and deny the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that's the spirit of antichrist. 58% all faiths teach equally valid truths. 51 don't believe Jesus from the dead, rose from the dead. That's impossible. You can't be saved if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can be religious. Dare I say you could even be Baptist. But you can't be a genuine born-again believer because if Jesus didn't die for your sins, then your faith is vain, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 68% don't believe the Holy Spirit is real. If you don't believe the Holy Spirit is real, you're going to reject him. You won't allow him to work in your life to bring conviction and conversion. 65% don't believe Satan is real, and he loves it that way. Paul goes on after that passage I just shared. People will not want to hear the truth, so they'll find teachers who will teach them what they want to hear. But what did he say to Timothy? Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of your ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will give me in that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. Timothy chapter 3 talks about what's going to happen in the last days, and I believe we're seeing it unfold in, around us. And when people turn to God, they don't want the God that the Bible talks about, so they refashion God according to Romans chapter 1. This is going to be a politically correct God and is going to let people live like they want and do what they want and, and, and try to bring God into the conversation. So what God says, no, they say, well, that's not what he meant. I know what he meant. And confuse people. But God is not the author of confusion. Satan is. And when there's confusion in the church... It's not because God is confusing. It's because Satan has found its way into the church. The sad tragedy is just, I believe that, I believe that the people who voted Jonathan Edwards out in 1751 thought they were honoring God. And I believe most of the people who claim to know God and yet don't want God's word. They want, they want to believe the lie that Satan told Eve. Yea, hath God really said? Is that really what God means? God doesn't expect you to adjust your life to him. You, you adjust God to your life. That's kind of the lie of Satan. 
truth is many of them are very sincere. But Jesus, right before telling the parable of the, the last parable of the Sermon on the Mount, his first recorded message about the wise man and the foolish man, he said this, many will say to me in that day, but Lord, Lord. Oh, right after he said, beware of false prophets, by the way. Because many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, look at all I did for you. And Jesus, I will declare unto them, depart from me. I never knew you. The tragedy of the tares is tares don't know their tares because they look sometimes better than real wheat looks. <laughs> sometimes they behave better than the real thing behaves to our shame. They believe what their preachers are telling them. They don't check the scriptures. The Bible says with fair words they deceive the hearts of the simple. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So if we don't deal with this issue individually at a heart level and corporately as a church, then we're going to find ourselves caught up in the current of compromise with God and the devil. You know, God doesn't compromise, but we do. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which though it be the least among all the seeds, yet when it planted and grows it becomes a great the greatest of the herbs so that the fowls of the air come and nest one little story and I'm done Ac, uh, John chapter 15 Jesus describes the church and what he's doing to a grapevine I have grapevines we all love little robins don't we <laughs> they sing they got the little red breasts they're pretty we love to watch them but you know what robins do to grapevines they build their nests in grapevines but you know what happens when the grapevine tolerates a robin's nest. Robin's drop in, dropping, robin, a robin's droppings poison the grapevine. It's a disease called phylloxera. And when we tolerate Satan in the church, or even people who mistakenly believe they're children of God, and yet they've never been truly born again. So all, they may be good people, they may be moral people, they may be kind people, they may be gracious people, but they're people without the Spirit of God. And since they don't have the Spirit of God, all they got is their own spirit. So they're going to reason and argue and move and maybe even manipulate in a way that makes sense to them and begin to influence the direction of the church. Are you a weeder or are you a tear? Let's pray. Father, 